Good morning. Welcome to our panel on building global resilience. I am Ramin Tului, the Assistant Secretary for Economic and Business Affairs at the U.S. State Department. And uh, nothing could be more appropriate to, to speak about uh, at this time than, than um, building global resilience, very consistent with the theme of this year's Borlaug Dialogue, Harnessing Change. And we're very fortunate to have an excellent group of panelists, government leaders, uh, to discuss this topic today. Uh, uh, immediately to my left is Norway's Minister for International uh, Development, Anna Tvinerim. Next to her, uh, UK Minister of State for Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs, Mark Spencer. And uh, at the end of our stage, Bahraini Ambassador to the United States, Sheikh Abdullah bin Rashid Al Khalifa. So thank you for the panelists for joining today. And uh, I'll just start off with a very a uh, general question, which is, what are the things that you're focusing on uh, in terms of government policy, innovations, uh, adaptations, uh, as most promising for addressing this topic of building resilience? And Anna, let's start with you. Sure, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. It's, it's an honor to be here and to celebrate uh, Heidi Keen and her ex extraordinary, uh, extraordinary achievements. Um, let me first say how special it is for me as a Norwegian to be at the Norman Norman Burleug seminar, as we call it in Norwegian. Um, you know, uh, 150 years ago, one third of the population of my country emigrated due to the food security situation in, in my country. And most of them ended up here in the Midwest. Uh, one, of, uh, one of them uh, was the ancestor of uh, Mr. Burlaug. They came from a small village uh, in, uh, uh, called Vik uh, in a fjord uh, in Norway. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm starting off with that story because that was the start, you know, that period when a third of my population emigrated was the start of the modernization of the agricultural sector in Norway. The huge transformation uh, where uh, with, with the organizing the farmers, with the shift of, of technologies and building the value chains from the producer to the local markets. And I'm saying that because that is the backdrop from, for why I as Minister of International Development have put food security and transformation of the agricultural sector in Africa as my priority number one, because in Africa, they still haven't started that shift. And it's a huge lack of opportunity, not only for food security and for fighting starvation, but also for reaching the SDGs and promoting development. Because we know that most of the 30 million small-scale farmers in Africa are self-subsistence farmers. Uh, while Africa imports 75 billion US dollars worth of foodstuffs every year. That is a huge lost opportunity. And what we need to do is invest in that food production from climate smart agriculture at the farmer's level. Easily available technologies, we know what to do, but we also have to invest in the whole value chain to the local and regional market. Now, that is number one in terms of building resilience um, in, in uh, uh, food security in Africa. And I have lots of examples to give, but I, I think I'll get the chance later. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Mark, you have experience of this not only uh, in your government role, but also uh, by virtue of working the land. So how do you yeah. view this? Yeah, I mean, what a, uh, what a moment in history that we're living, I think, at this moment in time. It's not wasted on me, sat here at the World Food Foundation, uh, that Norman Borlag was faced with similar challenges, that he foresaw the challenge of feeding the, the, the world and was able to develop new wheat um, uh, breeding techniques in order to meet that challenge. And I think we sit here today uh, with global population expanding, with uh, challenges of global conflict uh, impacting on, on global food markets. And we've got to find solutions to meet those challenges, 
but at the same time we've also got to deal with climate change and get to net zero as quickly as possible and that is a huge huge challenge for us globally as food producers and so we've got to rethink in the way in which we produce food uh, and we've got to make sure that we do that sustainably but sustainably in every sense sustainably in terms of the planet but also in terms of economics because we need our farmers to be profitable in in that process of producing food so in the uk we're changing the way in which we use taxpayers money to support those farmers moving away from direct payments for per acre per block of land into trying to encourage them to uh, adopt more sustainable practices to think about their soils to make sure those soils are sustainable for the for the next generation uh, to think about how they manage water and and nutrients to make sure that the nutrients they apply in in the terms of fertilizer are either generated organically on the farm by um, uh, by sort of spring cropping and and using overwinter cover crops but also to manage those nutrients in a way which they don't end up in our water courses and damage our, uh, our rivers and, and reservoirs. So we're, we're, we're trying to go in that direction, encourage farmers, and so far the, the uptake has been very positive. Uh, UK farmers want to embrace this. They want to work uh, with the environment, not against it, and the UK government will do its best to try and help and support them on that journey. Great. Uh, Abdullah, you have a unique perspective from the Gulf. Um, Mark was mentioning water, of course, a very you know, particularly important issue, but how, how do you see the most important issues from your perspective? Well, firstly, I'm uh, really thrilled to be here at the invitation of uh, Ambassador Branstad. This is uh, uh, a really momentous time to talk about an issue that has uh, governments scrambling to look at ways in which they can secure their populations through food security. And uh, when we talk about food security in the Middle East, the challenges that uh, His Excellency Minister Spencer talked about, um, they're, they're all over the world, but in certain regions, you find more or less the same challenges. So uh, in the past two years, we've seen how COVID has accelerated the rate at which governments are working closer together to find solutions to old problems um, via many means, uh, technology being one of them. And so uh, one of the areas in which Bahrain has really uh, invested in is uh, the infrastructure, making sure that we have um, ICT development throughout the country. And now we're at a stage where we're revisiting our national uh, food security strategy, aligning it with uh, some of the institutions that were established to make sure that everyone, all the stakeholders are, uh, are on the same page. And technology has really leapfrogged where we were a number of years ago to the potential of uh, wh what is achievable today. Uh, we can talk about areas like uh, hydroponics, for example, or uh, vertical farming. All of these issues uh, were probably not in the minds of a lot of uh, farmers maybe a decade ago, whereas today uh, this becomes a roadmap for a brighter future uh, given the, the, uh, the challenges that we face in the region. Thanks. Let me pick up on the, this last issue you mentioned about technology. I mean, I think it's, we can easily articulate the extraordinary challenges that we face, especially you know, related to climate change and COVID has demonstrated the, you know, the vulnerability of our supply chains. At the same time, of course, this year, artificial intelligence is receiving extraordinary attention. Um, and you know, for some time, uh, the, our agricultural innovators have been looking at how to use big data and the enhanced computational power to improve and strengthen uh, agricultural management. Then we all ha also have the issue of gene editing, which also offers an extraordinary promise for addressing some of these challenges. So I would be interested in your thoughts on some specific applications of technology that you're particularly uh, excited about, that you think offer a lot of promise, and what you think government can do to promote their adaptation. Maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, so I think, um, I think number one, uh, control of weeds within arable crops is one, one area in which we can really embrace new technology. So instead of using uh, traditional chemical 
um, solutions, if you like, to take out those weeds. You can do that by uh, uh, electric shock or by physical mechanical weeding, uh, but you need the AI to be able to identify the difference between the plant which you're growing and the weed which is in the same field, and that needs to do that in very rapid time. So that requires a huge amount of data and, and you know, really smart AI to be able to identify that. And I think we're all wrestling with these challenges internationally. Uh, it seems to me there's little point in Iowa State University doing that work if it's already been done somewhere else in, in the UK or in Norway. So we need to share that data and cooperate together so we're no, both not funding the same piece of research. We can share that data and share that IP uh, and then get those solutions in a practical sense down to the farmers that are actually doing the work. But that requires us to work collaboratively across the world. Mm. And there are some nations that are, are less good at that than others. And I think, you know, it's certainly in, in, in the West and in the Middle East, we're quite good at cooperation, but there are others uh, who don't cooperate, who steal IP for their own advantage. And I think we've got to find a way internationally to try and uh, stop that from happening and work together to share best practice. Mm. Uh, I want to go to you, and just one comment. I mean, I have to smile when you talk about the importance of exchange and international exchange of knowledge. That's, of course, the you know that the real motivating purpose of the Borlaug dialogue, where we're all here, and also was something that Norman Borlaug was extremely passionate about, and uh, his collaborations with scientists all over the world. So, uh, certainly applicable to our current challenges as well. No, I agree with my colleague. I mean, pres uh, AI. AI as uh, used in precision farming, for example, gives, it opens immense possibilities in farming all around the world. But if I may go back to Africa and see, you know, the, the leapfrogging that you can achieve there from self subsistence farming, it's amazing. Uh, and let me just mention two examples. Soil health. We know that uh, the soil quality in Africa, the soil in Africa is very, very degraded. It's degrading by the year. Um, and, and uh, regenerative techniques to build the quality of African soil is absolutely essential. And for that, uh, we are investing in soil mapping so that we can actually design the quality of the fertilizer for that particular region. And that's, it, it, it's, it will uh, provide amazing yields, but also make sure that we don't waste these resources so that it becomes uh, pollution. Uh, the second is, of course, in seeds. We should talk a lot more about seeds. Uh, and uh, adapted seeds for the new and challenging climate is essential. We have come a long way, but there's still a lot to do. In terms of, you know, for example, rice that can tolerate more salinity, salinity uh, more heat tolerant uh, maize and, and wheat uh, varieties. I mean, uh, we have so many things out there and we are putting a lot of money into research to, uh, to develop new seeds and also to get it out there. And, and we were talking backstage about, you know, to deploy these new techniques because farmers are conservative people. They need to make sure that this actually works, you know, in order to invest in something new. So uh, to invest in, um, uh, in um, uh, uh, extension services, I'm oh, sorry, I was looking for the word in, the word in English, extension services and uh, assistance to farmers on the ground is absolutely essential as we uh, go through this transformation. And just to add uh, to what was already mentioned, I think that there is uh, another angle that is extremely important in the development of food security uh, towards uh, governments throughout the world, which is the effect of foreign policy on food security. Uh, you see, in the past three years, I have witnessed uh, how the effects are direct in terms of um, yielding results. Uh, when there's a possibility that has opened up because of uh, let's say, opening up a diplomatic channel with a country that has excelled in a certain technology. All of a sudden, it's, it's, it's close to you. And you see a number of MOUs being signed. You see uh, information sharing. I think what we were lacking is that we had a lot of information, but we weren't able to gather it and place it in front of everyone. Uh, a number of years ago, we uh, came up with what's called agro.ph, a database that has uh, 
has been useful for farmers because now they can upload their information and they can interact with one another on a domestic level. But also when we look at foreign direct investment coming into the country, companies can look at what the opportunities are. Um, all the government legislation related to agro is up there and it becomes a seamless process for uh, investing in the country. Another thing that um, we should probably be talking about is not only investing in a country, but for countries to go out and invest in other countries, benefiting their local population and finding ways to export some of the produce uh, to the country itself. So that can also be a tactic in which countries can work closer together as, uh, as they move forward. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, you mentioned, Anna, what we were discussing a little bit um, backstage, the, some of the impediments to adoption of some of the cutting edge technologies, and Abdullah, you, you, were, you were part of this discussion as well. Um, I'm interested in, in what you see as some of the key impediments to either the, you know, to embracing some of these solutions to boost resilience, whether it's you know, adoption by farmers or policy impediments. What are the things that you think are, um, are uh, preventing uh, faster adoption of the kinds of things that we need to improve our, our resilience? I can Please. mention one thing, uh, finance. Mm. If we're going back to the African continent again, um, uh, there really, there is a lot of hesitation from private capital to invest in uh, in, uh, in the ag sector in, in Africa, but we know that the technologies are there and we know that there are lots of opportunities along the value chain. So I wanted to mention that because just two weeks, uh, a few weeks ago, USAID in Norway launched uh, a new facility, which is groundbreaking. I've, I've, I'm really excited about it. It's called the FASA Fund because we see that for the farmer, the small scale farmer to get their um, produce to the market. You know, we need all that stuff along the way in the value chain. And uh, many of those uh, SMEs do not get access to credit. They're too small for the commercial banks, um, but they are too big for microfinance. So we have put up this new fund, FASA fund, which will invest in SMEs that can help these farmers get their produce to the local markets. And that's the way of building development from sort of from the bottom up, uh, and I'm, I'm just as agricultural transformation was a motor in investment in our countries, this is the way ahead for many developing countries today, I'm sure of it. Mm -hmm. mm. I, I think there are two very practical barriers. One is getting that technology that is being developed in our universities into a practical means that can be delivered mm -hmm. by farmers in the field uh, and building that bridge so that the new technology which is being developed is, is thought of in the real world and is deliverable for real farmers. I think that's quite a challenge to, to build that bridge. And I think there's also quite a challenge in the fairness within the supply chain to make sure that the, the risk and the reward is shared fairly and is not taken by processors and retailers uh, and that, that the financial reward of these new developments and technologies is shared and, and trickles down to the practical farmer who is the primary producer of our, of our food products. Mark, can I ask on the first point you mentioned about that translating things in the research from research into um, into results on the ground and at a adoption on the ground. Any, can you point us in the direction of what kinds of things should be done to, to promote that? So I think we've got to invest in our farmers and give them the confidence that they can make mistakes, that they can do things which are really thinking outside the box uh, and in the way in which they're growing their various crops or producing uh, livestock products, that they can really uh, take a leap of faith and, and governments can support them with taxpayers' money so they can make those mistakes so that other farmers can learn from that, whether it's the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And I think particularly in meat production, you know, we, we, we're going to have to think long and hard about how we produce uh, beef, lamb and, and pork meat uh, and do that in a way which is more sustainable because I think we can throw all of our energy at changing 
changing diets and convincing people not to eat meat, but I think our consumers around the world like that product. They like to consume meat. So we've got to think as a farming community how we can do that in a more environmentally friendly way. And technology will help. Uh, I think different breeds will help uh, as well. And I think uh, gene technology may be able to assist us on that, on that journey. But we've got to make all of those things practical mm. so that farmers can engage with them and deliver them. Mm -hmm. I also think that one of the, um, the biggest challenges is that there's uh, so many other opportunities out there. So uh, a family that has been historically farming the land is now finding the younger generations looking at other opportunities beyond farming. Mm -hmm. And so if not a whole of government approach where you have uh, multiple incentives that keeps the business in the family and find ways to complete it, because sometimes farmers will probably be able to, uh, to work the fields, but then getting the product, let's say, out of the country uh, becomes part of the, the impediment. So uh, what we have done is we have established a number of entities to ensure that the entire supply chain or the entire process is being monitored by government and is being pushed uh, to, to, uh, to, to higher length. And so, um, a number of initiatives include uh, our labor fund, uh, Temkin, looks at funding SMEs uh, in the agrosphere. Uh, Bahrain Development Bank does the same thing. And so when you have multiple entities that are saying, look, here's the seed investment, uh, we'll, we'll try to um, arrange uh, for marketing companies to help you with packaging, we'll try to arrange with Export Bahrain, another entity that looks at uh, exporting product outside the country, you have a fuller cycle that will help um, the, the, the younger generations continue what the, their parents uh, have historically been engaged in. I think we're struggling all over the world with um, getting new generations into agriculture. At least it's a huge problem in my country. I believe it is uh, in the whole Western world. It is so in Africa. No, the, the new generation isn't finding um, farming very attractive. And, you know, basically it's about getting a decent income. First of all, people need to get a decent income from farming. Mm. But then, you know, talking about climates, we also know that the, uh, the, the, the younger generation, they want to be part of the solution. And I strongly believe that agriculture is, I mean, we, we talk a lot about agriculture as part of the problem uh, for uh, climate emissions, and it's true, but it's also obviously part of the solution. So that is uh, one way of getting farming more attractive, is to get the climate smart technology out there and, and showing how farming is part of solving the climate problem. I, mean, I think we can all play a part in that. I mean, everybody in this room today can play their part in evangelizing for, mm. you know, getting involved in, in food production globally because we need the brightest and best young people to come into our sector and to, to drive us forward to meet those huge challenges I spoke about uh, at the beginning. And I think, um, you know, if you're, a, if you're a young, very bright student coming out of university today and you're offered a career in engineering, then you're probably going to receive a, a larger salary than you would if you went into a food company. Mm. Uh, and we do need to recognize you know, the, the value of food. Mm. We seem to value other products higher than food. And I don't know how we've allowed that to happen as a, as a sector. We've sort of abdicated our responsibility to others to, to inform our consumers about how and where we produce food. And I think, you know, we've got the opportunity to change that around. You know, we've got the, literally the coolest brands in the world are in food and drink production, aren't they? You know, you think of brands as strong as McDonald's and Coca-Cola. These are global brands that are, are cool to the next generation. We just need to embrace all of that and encourage people to come into our sector. Well, I think that this, in terms of messaging to young people, emphasizing, I mean, young people are already focused on the, 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 the dire risks of climate change. And I think, so that's already very salient. And again, marrying that with the excitement around some of these cutting edge technologies, which offer opportunities in the agriculture space to try to you know, combat the effects of climate change on, on agriculture. I mean, I think anyone who's had the experience here of just talking to some of the graduate students that are around the Borlaug Dialogue, and they're incredibly excited about the work that they're doing. Um, 
And if you talk to scientists that are working in the agriculture companies, you get that excitement. And so I think broadcasting and advertising, how uh, exciting a field that is, and then making the connection uh, going from the, the laboratory, from research to uh, the deployment, making sure that connection is strong is, uh, is a key part of it. Um, Abdullah, you mentioned earlier this, the issue of the importance of the, you know, the political leadership and the diplomatic bridge building to try to facilitate the kind of collaboration um, on these challenges. I would just ask the other panelists, or, or if you have other examples, what are the other things that we need to be doing to promote collaboration uh, among different countries on these, on these challenges? Well, most importantly is to keep the conversation of food security as part of any conversation whenever there's a, an MOU or an agreement that's being drafted uh, this summer. You know, we've had uh, one of the strongest relationships uh, with the United States. It's over 130 years of uh, strong, consistent relations. And when we were talking this summer about elevating this relationship, there's this whole notion of uh, signing a, an agreement that is called uh, the Comprehensive Security and Prosperity uh, Agreement, SESIPA. Now, off the bat, you would think that it's related to defense, related to security. But when we added uh, prosperity to it, one of the components was obviously technology. How do we cooperate on technology? One of the subsets of technology is agro-technology. How can, how can we work together in this field to benefit both our peoples? And so that has really got me uh, on the road. Uh, we, we actually developed a an initiative called Beyond the Beltway, where I'm out. Um, this is not my first time to, uh, to Iowa. The first time was actually to uh, also food security related. I, uh, I heard that the uh, uh, sour cream raisin pie is, is, is a delicacy that you need to try here. So that was the first time I came here. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been flying out, trying to find ways of bringing uh, technology to Bahrain, and also using Bahrain as a test bed. Uh, we have a controlled environment, so I think finding win-win situations within a framework that countries uh, agree upon in an agreement like the one that we signed this summer is a way to keep the momentum going. So I think we do need to advocate that science is our friend. I think we've managed to get ourselves as a sector into a place where our consumers didn't recognize that science within food production was good, that they were cynical about gene editing and about uh, other technologies that we were embracing. I think we do need to make sure that we communicate to our consumers and they uh, understand that science is our friend. Science will be able to help us meet those challenges that we face. And I think you know, it, doesn't, it strikes me as ironic that if you are a uh, if you're a diabetic then you celebrate the fact that we can generate synthetic insulin you're happy to uh, inject that into yourself to help with your health condition and science can help in health but for some reason in food it's viewed much more cynically and i think we have an opportunity at this moment in time uh, following a global pandemic of COVID where science came to our rescue. Science generated a vaccine that protected us from a global pandemic and science will be able to do the same for, for food production. Uh, as long as we embrace that and we regulate it in a way which is safe and deliverable, I, I think we can sell that dream to our consumers that they'll be able to eat, eat good quality, healthy, reasonably priced food going forward because science will help us on that journey. Well, international cooperation in the area of food security is it's what, it's what I do every day. Uh, and there is a lot, a lot of cooperation going on. And, and uh, because we have very few years now to, to scale up our efforts in order to reach SDG 2, eliminating hunger by 2030. Um, and, and there are many good cooperations and partnerships going. I mentioned one with the uh, USA idea. Um, uh, the Global Fertilizer Challenge is another initiative where US and, and Norway works uh, very closely uh, related to soil quality and getting the right fertilizers out there. Um, 
research, obviously, into inputs uh, and technology, lots and lots going on. I wanted to mention one, one area where I think that we need a push, and that is um, uh, towards the upcoming COP, the climate negotiations that will take place in Dubai uh, in a few weeks. Because we all know that uh, transforming the food system is essential in order to achieve our uh, our uh, climate, uh, climate ambitions, uh, and it's still not on top there. I mean, there are, we're talking a lot more about energy transition than we are about food systems. And also, I wanted to raise the issue of climate finance, because donors around the world are, um, we, you know, we are scrambling now to get money for climate financing. Um, available for the green uh, transformation. But very, very little of that goes into uh, transitional food systems. And uh, I think that is, that is uh, uh, one area where we, we really need to help each other to push food systems as part of the global climate negotiations. And I wanted, if I may, make one final Please. point. Um, we're talking about the transition here, the, the, the long-term food security. Um, right now, uh, there are more hungry people in the world than ever before, and the numbers are staggering. 828 million people are you know, facing hunger, are food insecure, and that number has been rising steadily since 2014. And the budgets, the, the, the financing for humanitarian assistance, saving lives, saving people from dying from hunger, that financing is, you know, it's more and more limited because the catastrophes are just increasing, uh, the financing is shorter. What we need to do in international cooperation regarding that is to think more resilience as we invest in humanitarian assistance. It's what you might have heard of the nexus, it's a buzzword, but it's all about thinking uh, resilience as we invest in humanitarian assistance. You know, from day one in a humanitarian setting, we need to think what is the long-term plan to get from shipping in food and water to investing in local resilience in these uh, situations. Because we cannot continue fighting hunger in, hum in humanitarian situations the same way as we have. We need to think more long-term and we re really need to cooperate on that. Maybe I'll just, um, our time is all, almost up, I'll just make a couple of final observations on the point that you just raised on re resilience. This is something when we engage with our uh, African partners that they emphasize, that they, that they appreciate the humanitarian support, but they want that support in strengthening their food systems. And you mentioned earlier uh, soil health and, um, and seeds. This is actually an initiative that our special envoy for global food security, Kerry Fowler, is championing, championing vision for adapted crops and soils, uh, which is, you know, proposes to do this soil mapping that you're mentioning. This was announced a partnership with African Union and, and FAO in February. So do the soil mapping and also experiment with different varieties of, of drought resistant seeds um, to really again, try to prepare those food systems um, uh, so that we don't need to provide this kind of humanitarian assistance uh, in the future. I should also mention the last, uh, last comment um, as we close, very relevant to this topic, is to recognize that the first uh, Global Food um, Prize, World Food Prize laureate, uh, M.S. Swaminathan, recently passed away. Uh, he was uh, a collaborator with Norman Borlaug, in particular uh, crossing uh, Japanese and Mexican varieties of uh, dwarf varieties of wheat. And his work and deployment of this in India, you know, transformed India from being an, an importer of food and uh, at, at risk of, of um, food insecurity to uh, a self-sufficient in food. And, and so, uh, he spent his final years warning of the danger of climate change for global food security. But I think we should also take, uh, again, on the optimistic side, um, uh, recognize his example uh, for someone who rose to the challenge through collaboration. A lot of the things we were talking about, 
global collaboration, innovation, and a focus on diffusion and deployment to actually make a difference in the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Um, so on that positive note, I'd like to thank our panelists for the excellent discussion. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, I've been asked to make a final announcement, um, which is that following this session, the Regenerative Organic Agriculture Economic, Environmental, Scientific, and Human Impacts Breakout Session will be hosted by Gurgich Hills Estate and Roots of Peace in rooms 319 and 320 starting uh, in 10 minutes. Oh, well, now starting in three minutes uh, at 1125. AM. So please join me in thanking our panelists for this discussion. Thank you.